Hello, this is Mr. Ferreira, and I'm going to be talking to you through the next part of the course in terms of social influence. And as you can see from this particular slide, it says explanations for conformity, informational social influence, and normative social influence. Now, it also has quite a considerable, uh, a lot more added to this. This section here is something which will come in a different video because you'll see that this particular set of slides involves a kind of a new part of psychology in terms of thinking about evaluation and the next bit is, is, is quite big. So therefore I've split this up into different videos. So um, what we also can see is it uses the word explanation for conformity. It gives us a specific name. It says informational social influence and normative social influence. This is not to be confused with the previous section where we looked at types of conformity. And what I want you to do is think about the language used to explain things. And we see that a type is like a label and we have labels like compliance for conformity. And here we have explanations, which is asking us to look at why somebody would conform. And we see we have two reasons for this. The explanations that I'm going to use are the ones obviously named in the spec, but they come from Dayton Girard. This is not a name that we need to pay attention to because it's just giving credit to the person who developed this. But what we do see is that that there are two it's a two process theory. In other words, he, he says that when people conform, there's two processes that are happening. <clears throat> so let's look at the first process. The first process is simply called normative social influence. OK, if we take the word normative. We can see that we could this come stems from words like norm, normal, norm, social norm, those types of things. And this effectively does take us a long way into understanding exactly what normative social influence is. It's also quite clear that when we look at a type of conformity such as compliance, there's a good chance that a person who is complying is likely to be exerted or have exerted upon them normative social influence. Because what it says here is that an individual conforms because they want to gain approval. OK, so what we then can do to explain this is to simply say that as humans, we need to be liked. And of course, if I'm the person who's always doing something different to the group, there's a good chance that I won't be like. So therefore, as a social species, we need to potentially have companionship or, and um, and so therefore the best way to in, ensure this is is to do what they do. So therefore we say normative social influence involves conforming in order to gain approval. And this is about what is normal behavior for the social group. So it will often look like compliance. Um, in fact, if I wanted to give it a name, I could give it the name compliance. But this is about why are we doing this? So we are these social beings who need to fit in. And therefore, one of the ways in which we can fit in is to do basically what is normal for the group, do what everyone else is doing. And this is called normative social influence. Now, the other thing that we perhaps need to consider with normative social influence as to kind of why people conform, it's because we believe that we're being watched. So it says here we're under surveillance. So people are going to judge us for the behavior that we do. So in other words, we conform to the majority in the public because we believe that the public will be watching us. It also means that this is not something that is internalized. So therefore, it's quite temporary and does not endure over time. So that is normative social influence. Now, it's not that we need to put into one category um, compliance and to another category normative social influence, but we just need to make sure that we use the correct term at the correct time. 
So if they're asking us to give a label, to give a type of conformity, then of course we're going to use compliance. If we want to go, go further and explain people's conformity, then we're going to go down normative social influence in terms of the questions. The second explanation for conformity is informational social influence. Like we did previously, you take the word informational and you can see what meaning we can take from that. And of course, we can look at info or information. And so this is going to be about looking for information. And we see here it says it's a type of influence which results due or is due to the desire to be right. So, of course, in a social context, we may not always know how to be right. Therefore, this is one of the, the ways in which we are influenced or explains why we are influenced. It says that in order to be right, we might view that the group has better information than what we have. And therefore, conforming to their behavior may actually be a very sensible thing to do. So it says here, in a new situation, we look to others for information about how to behave. If we're unable to decide, unable to decide, we're likely to go along. Now, what we can also say is that there's a good chance that this is not just compliance because we didn't know what the right behavior was. It wasn't about trying to find out what was normal behavior. We didn't actually know. So therefore, it's going to be much deeper and perhaps in line with, with internalization. We internalize it because it's something that we actually believe to be right now. There's also a bit more information regarding informational social influence. We know that it often happens within these three occurrences when the situation is ambiguous. Now, that's a great word to use, but it just simply means when there is a confusion as to what is right, what is the right course of action. So it's ambiguous if we don't quite know where we should be going with our behavior. Now, of course, this may well link to a crisis. If we see something happening and we don't know what to do and we don't have time to think, we may certainly find that conforming to what other people are doing quickly is important and believe that their actions are right. Now, the final aspect of informational social influence, because it's based on being right, based on information, is, of course, if we view somebody else to be an expert, then we might view them as being somebody that we should follow. That's why we also should internalize it, because we need to believe that actually their actions are right because they know better. Now, actually, that's the knowledge part of this particular course. It tells us about the two explanations and we need to be able to explain quite clearly. Now, when I talk about knowledge, we see that when we start looking at the specification in greater deal, detail and look at, at exams, AQA tell us that there are some sections that require us to literally explain to write about knowledge in greater understanding, just demonstrate to the examiner that we know what we're talking about. And so far, that's all I've actually covered. Now we're gonna head into a kind of a different type of field, trying to get us to perhaps think about normative social influence and informational social influence. And I have a video for you to watch that will hopefully make you start thinking differently about the different things that go on in a social situation. Now, this is not a video to help you understand specifically informational and normative social influence. It's a video to help you kind of see that actual social influence kind of is often really interesting when we put it to test. And then from there, we'll look at something called evaluation, where we turn to the content that we've had in the knowledge and we start kind of thinking about, or well, how can we and be critical of this. But for now, it's worth kind of sitting back and enjoying the video. It might take a while to start. So I had difficulty with it last time.
There can make you an outcast. But what would you do if you knew your group was entirely wrong? Would you, for example, sit in a burning room just because everyone else does? This hotel conference suite has been prepared for a focus group discussion on internet shopping. But all is not as it seems. We've been busy. The place is rigged with four hidden cameras and six concealed microphones. And psychology professor Dominic Abrams is watching from our control room, which we built in an adjoining suite. Now it's just a question of sitting and waiting. Right, so this is a questionnaire all about kind of shopping habits and everything here. So I'll just move that off your chair. So you our first participant is Mary Mizuno, a London student who thinks she's arrived early. What she doesn't know is that behind this door, there's about to be a serious fire in the hotel kitchen, or at least the illusion of one created by a smoke machine and some sound effects. What will she do? Oh, she's now noticed the smoke and is concerned. At this point, she decides to investigate to find out what's going on. She's immediately taken responsibility for figuring out what to do. Mary does the sensible thing and evacuates quickly. She even leaves her bag and coat. As I've never been in a fire situation before, I tried to remember the kind of things that you're supposed to do, so I left my stuff and, and just went out. But Mary was on her own. This time, we've planted seven actors who are all in on the experiment. We've said to them, when you see the smoke, do nothing. Our second participant is Lauren Heffernan, also a student. What will she do? In this situation, she'll be following a script. The script is partly written in her mind. It's a script which is borrowed from things like sitting exams. Most situations like this have some element of expected or scripted behavior. But what will happen to her script when we make a slightly unusual situation very unusual? Nothing to start with, so we get her attention. Now, how long before she dashes out of the room? <coughs> She's checking increasingly to see what the other people are thinking. But who can she appeal to? The answer is nobody. She turns to the norm of the group, ignore the smoke. In a real fire, the people in this group would be in very serious danger by now. I was looking for some sort of reaction from someone else, even just the slightest little thing, that they'd recognise that there was something, you know, going on here. For me to kind of react on that and then do something about it, I kind of needed prodding. <coughs> She's waiting for someone else to react. Why isn't anyone else reacting? She feels uncomfortable. She doesn't want to embarrass herself by taking the lead, taking action. But something is definitely wrong. Lauren stayed in the room for 20 minutes after spotting the smoke, concerned but immobile. The fire brigade say that if this fire had been real, even if flames hadn't burned through the door, she would have died of asphyxiation in this time. In the end, we had to ask her to leave. Look out here. Thanks. I was surprised that I didn't do anything at all. I was just literally waiting. I just thought that someone else is surely going to say something soon. And because no one else did, I just didn't react at all. We tried the experiment ten times, and the same thing happened over and over again. If the person was on their own, they left quickly. If they were in a group of three or more, they stayed, rooted to the spot. The average length of time they stayed, 13 minutes. Now, this doesn't deny or confirm any of the, 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 the kind of content that I've said beforehand. We see that there's definitely a normative pressure there for the people in the groups to kind of do what the group is doing, and that is ultimately to ignore the fire. Now, 
as this video progresses, we see that it's quite disturbing because obviously um, it's going to involve kind of a real fire and especially kind of looking back on Grenfell and places like that where people died because they did what they were told to do. Um, there's obviously some real sensitivity we need to think about this. But if we're looking at those two influences, normative social influence and informational so social influence, what is happening is people are doing these kind of comparisons, doing the kind of understanding kind of what are the rest of the people doing. And certainly as this video progresses, you'll see very interesting facts about kind of um, kind of people's behavior based on what is normal. In real fires, people die because of behavior like this. In 1979, a blaze at Woolworths in Manchester killed 10 people. The fire occurred during the day when the, the store was occupied by hundreds of people. Most of those people managed to get out quite safely. The people that died in the fire were actually using the restaurant at the time. But why so many fatalities in the restaurant? Investigators eventually realized that people simply hadn't evacuated. They'd waited to pay their bills. That was their routine. We go into a restaurant. We, we sit down, the waiter comes over, we choose a meal, we eat the meal, we pay for the meal, and then we leave the building. That's our script, if you like, for eating a meal. Worse still, everyone was following the same script, and no one wanted to be the only one to stray. One of the main reasons why people died in the Woolworths fire is because they didn't want to be the first to react. They didn't want to stand out for the crowd and went along with the, the crowd behaviour. Only one person in our experiment didn't go along with the crowd behaviour, artist James McKechnie. What's that coming up from under the table? <laughs> Is it fire? Uh, I don't Wait till she comes back. Yeah. Yeah. She said just to wait here, didn't she? What? Is that? What is that? I don't know. She said just to wait here, didn't she? She's coming right down now. James isn't going to sit in a dangerous room just because everyone else does. Yeah. Or is he? The power of the group proves irresistible. The reassurances of the rest of the group that somebody else is responsible seem to be sufficient to pull him back into place. Instead of leaving the room and calling for help, he sits back down again and waits. Yeah. Now everybody's looking at the smoke, but in some ways that gives the group even more influence. After all, if everybody can see the smoke and no one's panicking, well, it would be crazy for him to do it too. James stays in the room for another 10 minutes before finally leaving. In a real fire, he wouldn't have been able to leave. He'd have been unconscious and close to suffocation. Okay, so that was fascinating to watch because what we see is that the power of the group is incredibly powerful and potentially could be dangerous. And so Hopefully it started you thinking about the situation about conformity. Do we simply blindly follow and do what other people do? Or do we actually teach young people to think for themselves and to um, kind of kind of have a kind of a sense about what they should do, and what they shouldn't do? And also I'm hoping that what it is giving you is some, some kind of sense that we do need to start questioning kind of how we show that in an exam that the theory the knowledge could actually have some questions about it so what i move into is we simply call it evaluation now i don't know if you've used this language before i hope you can appreciate that if i break it down it just says do we find value in informational and normative social influence kind of content okay now there's several ways that you can um, do this and in psychology we're going to show you some of the ways that we do and one of the 
kind of more basic ways would be to look at things like strengths and weaknesses. Now we would say that, well, that's kind of something that you'd want to kind of use for GCSEs, but for A-levels, we might look at different type of language to describe strengths and weaknesses. Um, you're also going to get kind of discussion questions where we've got to potentially take our ideas kind of further and kind of make them kind of question and answer and question again type of responses. So one of the things that you can say is that if the workbook has an evaluation session sec section, it means that there is extended answers or essay type of questions that could be asked. Now you noticed for types of conformity, there wasn't any evaluation because it is simply literally, literally applied as in who's who's complying or um, or what is internalization or things like that. But with informational social influence, there is an opportunity here to say, well, have other people found something similar to this? Is it possible that we can add value to this? OK, now I have two points that I think are fairly simple. And as we continue with Ash, we can add something further in the, the next section. But for now, let's look at this. Now, what I have in the notes here is I have a sentence in red that says, there is research support for informational social influence. Okay, now that is my point. Okay, so we can say that's P. And the point is, this idea of research support. So it's a bit like a strength, but what we see is what value does this add? Because what it's actually saying to the examiner is that I understand that other people have done research that's not specifically on informational social influence, but they've done research, but when I put it together with the knowledge of informational social influence, it seems to support what they were saying. Now, in this particular context, we always have to use a name. And in this case, we use Lucas et al. And that's evidence. OK, a couple of things about this. Et al just simply means that Lucas worked with a team of researchers. So it's not just two names, it's three names or more. And so therefore, Lucas was the main person who published the work. And we also know that they published the work in 2006. Now, in the exam, you don't need dates. The reason I include dates, because actually it could help us understand where it comes from. And certainly at university, you will have to put dates in any form of writing that you would have. But of course, you'd have notes in front of you to copy it down. So why does Lucas explain or support informational social influence? Well, let's have a look at what he says. Now, I'm also aware that I've got to explain to you kind of what Lucas did. In the exam, you might want to summarise this down. But what he did is he get, gave his participants a set of maths problems. He then asked them to call out their answers one by one. Now, of course, the participant didn't know that actually other people in the room weren't real participants. They were just there to help the examiner. And what we found that as the questions got more difficult, so did the conformity increase. So it says there was greater conformity to incorrect answers when the questions were difficult. OK, so greater conformity when the questions were difficult. Now, of course, once we've covered this in ASH, you'll kind of understand a bit more as to what I'm talking about, because the people who are in on the experiment didn't just give the correct answer, they deliberately gave the incorrect answer. And what we found was the participant did listen to the incorrect answer, more so as the questions got more difficulty. So it's kind of like me saying to you that what's happening here is that they don't know the answer, and so therefore they gave the, the wrong answer because the group had given it. Now, there's two other parts to our evaluation, A and C. 
A is analysis where we try and explain why Lucas is relevant to this particular part of the evaluation. And then C can take two parts. One of it can be a counter if I've got some other research that goes against this, or I could continue it onto another person who agrees with Lucas and the point of research support. Obviously, this will become clearer to you as we go through the course, but I feel that it's important for you to, right from the start, to get used to the way that we think and the way that we write in psychology. So, this is part of my understanding of the experiment and could be part of the whole an, an analysis part. So, what we can add to the particular study is that he didn't just make the questions kind of easy to hard. He looked at people's ability or self-efficacy, their belief in how good they are at maths. So there can be some people who are brilliant at maths and other people are pretty rubbish. Okay, so pretty much even the people who are good at maths, as they got to questions that they did not know the answer to, they're more likely to conform. So that people conform in the situations where they feel they do not know the answer. So if the group appear to know the answer and I don't, what, what's actually happening is I'm looking for information in order to be right. So I then say as my analysis, this is the predicted outcome of informational social influence. I would expect people to assume that the majority must be right when they cannot objectively measure accuracy themselves. Okay, so in other words, that study has shown quite literally what informational social influence is. Now, what I haven't done is put a counter or continuation in on this. And we can, as we progress with the course, we can come back to this and we can add a point to it. But certainly, every evaluation paragraph should have some kind of structure. Now, in English, you probably use, or, or history, you probably use Peel, and this is quite similar to that. It's kind of like a structure that you should add to any form of extended writing. And what I mean by extended writing is a question that has eight marks or more. Now, often in this particular context, if it was a straightforward essay, we would be looking at trying to write knowledge about informational social influence and normative social influence. So, of course, it's quite good for me to also have a point that supports normative social influence. OK, so it's very similar to beforehand where it says there's research that supports normative social influence. And we also see that we can use this to promote positive behavior. OK, can promote positive behavior. So this is a bit of application. Now, it's not necessary for this particular point, but I quite like it. And it's also quite a simple piece of research. Now, what it did was Schultz and his team, they went to a hotel. OK, and they wanted to see whether they could persuade guests to reuse their towels. Now, of course, there's lots of reasons why we would want to do this because having a fresh towel every day is fantastic, isn't it? However, it does take quite a lot to make sure that you have clean towels. So that has quite a large environmental impact. It also has quite a lot, lot of cost implications. So therefore, if, a, um, if somebody staying in a hotel potentially uses their towel for at least two days or, or, or something like that, there's a good chance that um, I will save money and save a bit of the plants as well. So how did they do this? Well, they did it in a very simple way. There was no big message blaring. There wasn't this kind of 1984 type advert playing in the background. All there was was a simple note by the counter that said 75% of guests choose to reuse their towel each day. This is not an order, it's just simply a bit of information. However, it is a normative message rather than an informational message because of this idea of 
that means that the majority of people are reusing their towels. Now, of course, what you will have then is you'll have a group that receives the message and a group that don't. They can be our control. And what it says is that it's normal to reuse the towel. And what we found was that when we compared the two groups, the group that were given the message reduced their towel use. So in other words, they changed their behavior to fit in with the 75%. And I think that's pretty awesome anyway. So it simply says this study shows that people conform to what they consider to be normal. In other words, they have shown that normative social influence is very real. Now, when we have covered ASH, there will be a point that we can add to this as a continuation and certainly can help us with this. Now, I haven't tried to push this too far because it's really important that we do understand kind of where this takes us. Now, just to finish with, I'm going to do two things. I want to show you some extra piece of information that you might want to have a look at and then also show you an exam question. So firstly, a bit of extra in information. The BBC have a series of podcasts. Now, when they first were recorded, I don't think they were quite seen as podcasts, but certainly um, it's a very worthwhile um, kind of set of programs that you um, can find. Now, I haven't actually looked to see whether you can find them as podcasts on Apple or Spotify or any of those type of places, but if you do follow the link, it should take you to a website. Now, I don't know if I will be able to go there. No, I don't think I can. Um, but it's a really, really good um, kind of set of um, interviews where the person is trying to kind of explore ideas. And this particular one is about research done by Tajfal. Now, Tajfal was one of the people who were quite critical of the normative and informational social influence because um, he felt that when research is done in this capacity, people aren't really acting like groups. And so he wanted to kind of say that um, the group behavior is or belonging to a group is really, really powerful. And he did some research with some boys where they were asked to complete the simple task. And, and the best way to be successful and is, is to kind of work out as a whole group that, that how the game is going. But he found that each team pretty much kind of kind of fought for their own kind of right um, to kind of be there and, and, and often at the expense of, of everyone. Um, so definitely worth having a look at um, on your spare time. Now the last thing for us to do before we finish is to look at a question. Now it says SAM3. Um, so yes, yeah, some questions have names like SAM. Um, all it stands for is sam sample assessment material. It came from um, one of the, the third papers. But what I really like about this particular paper is it combines a number of issues here. It combines this issue that psychology is often applied. We don't just think of it as a theoretical kind of construct that we need to kind of understand content and write down on a piece of paper. Sometimes we look at a scenario and that's, this, that's what's written in blue there. And we have to try and make sense. So we see here we have two people, Steph and Jeff, they're student teachers, who recently joined other members of staff on a one day strike. When asked why they decided to do so, Steph replied, I never thought I would strike, but I listened to other teachers' arguments and now I've become quite passionate about it. Jeff's explanation was different. To be honest, everybody else seemed to be striking. I didn't want to be the one the only one who wasn't. Okay? I don't want to be critical of either Steph or Jeff because they've chosen to join their fellow teachers. But, of course, they have different reasons. But, actually, one of the things that you might have noticed is both those statements are not the question. So one of the things I would recommend in this particular context is to have a look at the question first before you read the scenario. And what it says is discuss explanations for conformity. That's the question. Discuss explanations for conformity. So in other words, we could go to our knowledge that says 
we know that there's something called normative social influence and there's something called informational social influence. And we could write certainly a paragraph or two relating to both those two pieces of content. But it uses a word discuss. Now that's just kind of language to say, I would like you to evaluate it as well and also to try and see if you can make sense of it. It's kind of like an argument rather than just a couple of points put together. Now, of course, there's another part of it. It does say refer to Steph and Jeff as part of your discussion. So in other words, what they do want you to do is to take this piece of text and take something from it at least, and this piece of text and take something from it and to write about it. Now these particular essays are worth 16 marks. They have a bit of a structure that we need to follow. The first part of it is to write knowledge, and that's that, that K stands for knowledge. In other words, use your notes to basically explain what normative and informational social influence is. There's also application, and that will be where we take direct quotes from Steph and Jeff, and we try and make sense of what they did, and try and tie it in to the knowledge. Okay, so application ties into the knowledge. And then the final part, and that's why it's plus, evaluation. So in other words, do we have any points that we can use to be critical of what we've written? In this particular case, it's actually quite simple. We can look at Steph's kind of response where she said, I never thought I would strike, but I listened to other teachers. This is like that she was looking for information and she believed that their information must be right and they were quite passionate about it. And so, so she becomes quite passionate about it. Clearly she has internalized it so therefore this must be informational social influence. We see Jeff is different and it looks like maybe in the future he wouldn't strike, but his reason for striking is that everyone else seems to be striking. So therefore he wanted to fit in, he looked to the group to see what was the normal behavior and in turn he, he, he acted in that particular way. So therefore it's quite clear that he must be acting according to normative social influence. Now, as you can see there, I've explained mostly what would be found in the application and I've linked it back to the knowledge. Okay, and then I'd still would have more to write on evaluation, I haven't started it yet. And we could use the two evaluation points that I have, the Lucas et al and the Schultz et al, where they both have support for the, the, the knowledge where one talks about normative and the other one talks about informational. We could even link it back to the actual individual people. So in the Lucas et al, it's kind of a bit like Steph. She doesn't know what is right and she's turning to the people and seeing that, oh, they must be right, so she does what they do. Jeff, on the other hand, is a bit like the Scots, seeing that the message that 75% of the people are doing this, he goes along and does it as well. So there we go, we have now finished quite a large section on social influence and specifically covered the topic that says explanations for conformity. I hope you enjoyed the video and certainly I'll be continuing with the series as best